Hey, Mike here. I just wanted to let you know that you can listen to Dark Poutine early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. You're about to listen to a historical episode of Dark Poutine. After episode 149, you will find Scott is no longer with the show. In an effort to maintain continuity and offer listeners as many episodes as possible, we are leaving the episodes in which he co-hosted intact. Thank you. Welcome to Dark Poutine. I'm Mike Brown, creator and host. With me as usual, from his underground lair, is my good friend and co-host, Scott Hemingway. Say hello, Scott. Well, hello, everybody. The lair sounds cool. I, I expect a dragon to emerge from behind me at some point. Are you hiding lots of gold? Do you have, like, smog the dragon behind you? And uh... <laughs> No, I have none of those things. No? I wish, I, although I would really love to have some fat gold chains around my neck. Some fat gold chains? Yeah, yeah. And Early a nice L- grill? L- cool J style. Yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. <laughs> Work on my fronts. Yeah, I, I think uh, if my mustache would hide my grill. It would. It yeah. very, ooh, what about a gold? Just get that thing, just dip it in gold. And uh, <laughs> just you're starting a new trend. The views, information, and opinions expressed during the Dark Poutine podcast are solely those of the producer and do not necessarily represent those of Curious Cast, its affiliate Global News, nor their parent company, Chorus Entertainment. Dark Poutine is not for the faint of heart or squeamish. Listener discretion is strongly advised. We're not experts on the topics we present, nor are we journalists. We're two ordinary Canadians chatting about crime and the dark side of history. Let's get to it. Put on your toque, grab yourself a double-double and an Nanaimo bar. It's time to scarf down some dark poutine. Chompa chompa woo <laughs> We're having fun in the umber yard, at least. Are we? I am. Yeah, I'm not on social media that much. What's happening in the umber yard? No, not much. I po- I post things about uh, our prime minister and. Oh my god! Yeah. Well, we yeah we talked about that. Mm-hmm. Oh. And Doctor Bonnie Henry. Someone did a nice piece of art, a little cartoon of her. She, she's the BC doctor. Yeah. Is she the BC or the Canada one? She's BC. Okay. Have you watched the news, Scott? Not, not much, actually. Not lately. Wow. I've just been I've been burying my my schnoz in video games so that I don't have to pay attention to the world at this point. This is this is self quarantining at its best. Oh, good. Just been playing video games. That's uh, I think the best way to handle all of this. I get to shoot things. Thought you'd be uh, watching CNN obsessively. Oh, I, I did until I went on leave. Well, not leave, whatever, The you know, until I was off work for the week. And uh, then I was like, no, I just, I can't just sit here and entrench myself in this. No. I'll flip the news on here and there to see some updates and stuff. But I, uh, yeah, for my sanity, I got to shoot some things in the video game world. So a little bit of an extra caveat this week. We will be talking at times in this episode about... Death by suicide. Listeners who feel they are in crisis can contact the crisis text line in Canada by texting HOME to 686868 in the United States or UK, you can text 741741 and you'll be matched with a volunteer counselor who is supervised by a licensed trained mental health professional. Crisis text line is free, 24 hour support for those in crisis. For gl- more information, go to crisistextline.ca in Canada or crisistextline.org in globally. Let's get on with the show. This week, I was thinking, what can we do that isn't murder, but still is dark? Oh, oh, and what did you come up with? Well, this week we're going to the province of Ontario and specifically Niagara Falls. 
Oh, okay. I think I see where this is going. So as well as tourists and honeymooners, Niagara Falls attract all types. Sadly, many people with suicidal intentions, averaging about 12 per year, have also ended their lives plunging from the falls into the rocky torrents in the whirlpool below. A dozen people a year. That Golden Gate Bridge sort of numbers. I was just going to say, I wonder how that lines up to other well-known hotspots. Many more people in crisis are saved every year by first responders before they can complete those final acts. So that's great. There are people around. There's police officers and other first responders on bicycles. Yeah who will see somebody going too close to the railing and they're right there. I walked past a person on a bridge who was about to jump. I don't know if I ever told you that, but that was terrifying. Did you stop them? It was a very, very terrifying situation. It was about two in the morning. Uh, I think it was the Granville Street Bridge. I was walking home and pitch dark and... You know, I'm a good 30 feet away and you, I can see somebody and you're like, is this person leaning against the railing or aren't they? And the closer I get, you realize this is somebody standing on the outside and the person's looking right at me. And it's really difficult to figure out in that moment when you're unprepared how you should best handle it. Because yeah. part the, the the biggest part of me is like, I should stop and I should try to grab the guy or I should try to maybe talk him down. But then again, I'm not a professional. Maybe me saying something agitates him more, mm. which leads him to jump. And so you're, but you're like, I can't just pretend like I don't see him. Like you're really kind of like, what do I do? I, I just kept walking until I thought I was out of eyesight. And then I just took off running and took to get off the bridge. The second I got off the bridge, I called 911 and they got yeah. somebody up there. Oh, so. Yeah, yeah. So the it's, person it's, lived. Well, they wouldn't tell me, but I got the feeling because I was like, they're like, okay, it's been take, you know, it's been addressed, and I'm like, is the person okay? And they're like, well, we can't, you know, uh, if it was you, you would want privacy, and I'm like, no problem. But I got the feeling that they had uh, uh, got him off safely. I'll never forget the look in the person's eyes, man. I bet. Oh, oh my God, yeah. As well as tourists and the depressed, there are another group uh, of people who are obsessively drawn to Niagara Falls. And for almost two centuries, attention-seeking stunt performers have flocked to Niagara Falls. It's a natural, uh, have flocked to this natural wonder, performing numerous dangerous stunts, trying to beat the falls. Uh, some have been successful, some not so much. Uh, did somebody tight rope across it? Yes, we're about to hear about that. Oh, oh, perfect. This is episode 120, Over the Edge, Death and Daring at Niagara Falls. I don't think I've asked you yet. Have you been to Niagara Falls, Scott? I haven't. I, I really would like to, but uh, I haven't. I feel like I have. but I've been there twice, but I've never done the boat tour that you can do. I've always just sort of looked... Um, over the railing. Yeah. The falls straddle the Canada and U.S. border between the province of Ontario and New York State. And although they're not the world's largest, Niagara Falls is the most accessible. It's probably why it's the most popular. Every year, 14 or as many as 20 million people visit to view. It makes it the most famous waterfall in the world as well as the most photographed. Like I say, there are bigger waterfalls. There's actually quite a few bigger ones, but... They're not as uh, centered around population. Yeah, and that's kind of why I was saying, like, I feel like I've been there just because of how uh, uh, much it's covered in the media, how many photos you see of it, and, you know, New Year's celebrations. That, like, just there's, you're inundated by photos and videos of the Niagara Falls. So I, f I feel like I know it quite well. Yeah, lots of those honeymooners putting on their rain jackets and getting on the Maid of the Mist and going to take pictures with the falls in the background. And the falls are also lit up at night, 365 days a year. It's, it's quite awesome to see after dark. I've been there twice. Yeah, you mentioned that. Uh, how long ago? A few years ago, I, I went there when I drove to Nova Scotia. We drove around there at night. And then when we went for Carol's grandma's birthday, quite a number of years ago, we all went to Niagara Falls one day. It was quite nice. Oh, nice. Yeah. 
So there are three different waterfalls that make up Niagara Falls. The largest is Canadian Horseshoe Falls, followed by the American Falls and the Bridal Veil Falls. And the full width of the entire falls is about 3,950 feet, which is 1,204 meters. Horseshoe Falls has a height of about 167 feet. That's 51 meters. So from the top of the falls to the water, that's quite far. Mm -hmm. And spans over 2,700 feet or 823 meters across its crest. So that's, you think about that, that's pretty big. Yeah, giant. American Falls drops between 90 and 120 feet and spans about 940 feet at its crest. Bridal Falls also has a drop of 90 to 120 feet, but is only 45 feet wide. But altogether, that's quite a massive group of waterfalls. Yeah, yeah, no kidding. The volume of water over Horseshoe Falls is a whopping 2,271,247 liters per second. <laughs> Holy shit. Per second. My God. That's massive. Holy shit. The volume of water over American Bridal Falls is 567,810 liters per second or 150,000 gallons per second. So there is a lot of water that's flowing through there. That's a lot of volume. Yeah. I think it's the amount of water that Carol uses when she takes a shower. Because <laughs> there's never any hot water left. <laughs> Uh, the sound of that amount of water falling is, is quite loud. From NiagaraFallsTourism.com, quote, Father Lewis Hennepin, who's said to be the first white person to write and draw a sketch of Niagara Falls, said in 1678, quote, It throws off vapor, mist, that can be seen at a distance of 16 leagues, which is 48 kilometers, and may be heard at the same distance when it's calm. Yeah. Yeah. Isn't that crazy? <laughs> wow. So it's not that loud today because, as NiagaraFallsTourism.com goes on to say, the main reason for the falls not being heard from long distance now is that since the early 50s, half the water that could go over Niagara Falls is being diverted to power generating power plants at Queenston, Ontario and Lewiston, New York. Oh. In the winter months, another 25% of Niagara River water is diverted to create electricity. Well, I'm okay with that. And the word Niagara is, as with many place names in Canada, believed to have been derived from names or descriptions given by indigenous people, specifically the Seneca and Mohawk nations, who had inhabited the land for eons prior to the arrival of European settlers. Sweet! According to an article on the meaning of Niagara written by Alan Hughes in 2010 on the Brock University website, quote, the name Niagara first appears in the form on the Guajara. Good try, Mike. And that's from the writings of Jesuit priest Jerome Lalemont, superior to the Huron mission in 1641. That's a few years ago. A few years ago. Yeah. The word is clearly of Aboriginal origin, but Lalemont says nothing about its meaning. However, a survey of subsequent literature reveals two dominant interpretations. The first with obvious reference to Niagara Falls is thundering waters or some equivalent like resounding with great noise, while the second apparently referring to the Niagara River is neck, denoting the strip of water connecting the head and body of Lakes Erie and Ontario. Sure, I'm good with either. You take your pick, Mike. Geologists date the age of the falls to between 12,000 and 15,000 years old. Hmm. NiagaraFallsTourism.com gives us the Coles notes of the creation of the falls, saying, During the glacial epoch of the Earth's history, that's 500,000 to 2 million years ago, glaciers melted and formed lakes. Lake Algonquin, located where Lake Erie is now, overflowed and ran downhill to Lake Iroquois, where Lake Ontario is now. The rushing water we know as Niagara River dug out a path to Lake Iroquois, the falls were formed, the riverbed dropped off suddenly like an underwater cliff. The water raced over this cliff, forming Niagara Falls. Oh, son of a bitch. It's also estimated that in another 10,000 years, erosion will complete its work and the falls will no longer exist. Boo. Yeah, I don't know how accurate that is. 10,000 years? To the day. I guess so. I don't know. I don't know how... how quick things erode, but that doesn't seem like a lot of time. 
Yeah, I, I, yeah, I hear you. I, I, it would make you think that we'd see visible erosion currently, but uh, yeah, I'm sure there is if you are to uh, look at time lapse photos over the decades, but. So there have been some accidents, but mostly suicides account for the 5,000 plus corpses pulled out of the waters beneath the falls since the 1850s. The bodies of some of those who've lost their lives over the falls have never been retrieved at all. I was always curious about that. Oftentimes they'll find them down river, mm -hmm. even sometimes months later, as we'll learn later on. Mm. In 2018, journalist and author Michael Clarkson published an 82-page book titled River of Lost Souls, What We Might Learn from Niagara Falls Suicides. Clarkson himself, a survivor of the family disease of depression, became interested in the topic after a former classmate and friend, nationally renowned poet and Niagara Falls native Robert Billings, climbed over the railing at the falls and plummeted to his death in 1986. According to an interview Clarkson provided to Sharon Kirky for the National Post, his goal in writing the book is not to romanticize suicide, but to understand, inform, and ultimately to help prevent. According to Clarkson, all types of people are hypnotically drawn to the falls as a place to end their lives. In the book, Clarkson quotes a professor of psychology at Niagara University and a clinical psychologist named Dr. Timothy M. Osberg. And Osberg says, quote, if a person has a proclivity to commit suicide, he or she may feel drawn to the hypnotic effect of the falls. They feel the force of nature and their death is like committing one's body back to nature, end quote. Well, that's an interesting outlook on it. I, yeah. I, 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 as you're saying it, I'm like, yeah, I can, I can get that. The book is a short, compelling read. As I said, it's only 82 pages, but it's packed full of thoughtful but dark insights into the final moments of people who have been obsessed with the falls. Clarkson wrote of a, quote, 2011 case of a 51-year-old Canadian woman who was seen on a video swimming and then floating casually on her back as she dropped over the brink. Oh. Tourists were horrified. The woman's body was later recovered by crew members of the Maid of the Mist. Police didn't release her name or why she did it. And uh, I can kind of see it in my mind's eye, the moment you see the person drifting closer to the yeah. falls, yeah. you know, and and then they're pulled over and gone in an instant. And I'm sure the people viewing the falls that day cried out as she drifted to her doom, you know, like, what are you doing? Stuff like that. Yeah. I want to believe that the person is in a positive kind of tranquil meditative state in that moment if you're on your back and you know i'm going to go be a part of the earth but um i think it's going to vary per individual i really mm. do you know yeah. um she may have been a meditative but other people may just be um uh, their brain maybe just in in a frenzy at the moment and mm. uh, it's just it's i've seen uh short videos or gifs of uh, people like jumping over the railing and into the water but i've never seen anything of people going over i've never yeah. seen video or anything so it, it's yeah I, I, it's it's not a thing i can really watch if you get a chance and are interested in the subject, uh, the book again is River of Lost Souls, What We Might Learn from Niagara Falls Suicides. It's available to read for free in Canada right now with a Kindle Unlimited subscription. So That's cool. We'll come back to Mr. Clarkson's book to talk about a recent daredevil later on in the show. There are a number of people who have gone over the falls on purpose, fully intent on surviving. <laughs> are there barrels involved, Mike? There are barrels. Okay, yes. <laughs> a recent successful stunt, though, that didn't include plunging over the falls in any kind of contraption was performed in 2017 by Arendira Walenda. Do you know that name, the Walendas? Yeah, the flying Walendas, yeah. That's them, yep. Yeah, yeah. She is a member of the famous high-flying trapeze family, and she hung by her teeth from a helicopter over the falls. Here's some audio from Global News coverage of that event. I'm guessing it's going to sound like this. No, I have nothing to say. I'm not, no, I won't open my mouth. This was going to be a journey like no other. 
a death-defying dangle from harrowing heights. And just like that, by the skin of her teeth, Erin Dira Walenda conquered Niagara Falls. The fearless aerialist performed a series of maneuvers on a hoop while suspended from a helicopter, at times holding on by her toes, at others, the strength of her iron jaw keeping the daredevil dangling 300 feet over the raging waters of Niagara Falls. Ooh, um, it's good to be back on the ground, but like I was saying before, I respect this man so much more because that was way more windy than I thought it was going to be. That was the idea. Yes. Last time I, when I did the walk five years ago, she goes, that was nothing. Who cares? No. Now she knows. The Walendas say the stunt broke a height record Nick Walenda had previously set in 2011. It was great. It was spectacular. The Catlin family were one of hundreds who traveled far distances to take in that stunt. If she's going to fall or not. Did you have butterflies in your stomach? Mm-hmm. The performance comes on the fifth anniversary of her husband, Nick Walenda's televised high wire walk over Niagara Falls. Many tourists making the pilgrimage this time around too. You know, he walked it, she hung by the teeth. Yeah. And like I said, what a man can do, a woman can do better. Very courageous of her to go up there like that. I couldn't do it. The mother of three dangled by her teeth for over 20 seconds, breaking her husband's world record. Once I you know, looked up and I saw my husband smiling at me and he's like, you got this, babe. I was like, yeah, you know what? That's right. And, and then it was, you know, I was able to sort of relax and then take it all in. The 2012 stunt proved to be a major shot in the arm for the local economy, and that's what they're hoping to do with this. From being on television reports, you know, worldwide, that coverage is invaluable. You can't put a price tag on it. We know the value. It will be in the millions. So $120,000, small investment. Erin Dira Walenda set out to break a world record, get attention doing it, and to inspire people to never give up on your dreams. Talk about achieving your goals. Mina Ree, Global News. Whew. Yeah. Well, my, and when she said when she said I looked up and I saw my husband's face and I just relaxed, I thought, "What you you're relaxing while your <laughs> jaw is clenched? Well, doesn't that mean you let go and plunge to your doom?" <laughs> so, I I don't think I have enough faith in my teeth. Right. <laughs> First off, you get better have good denture cream. Yeah, like yeah, and I'm just I'm a I'm a hard no on that one. Um, yeah, I I you know I can understand the thrill of doing something like that. That you going through all of the 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 fear, but then once completed, how alive you must feel. But you know mm -hmm. what? I also feel pretty alive right now. Sure, and I'm not you know, yeah. Just just me thinking of hanging off my my. Uh, uh, door frame by my teeth scares the shit out of me. In 1829, the first recorded daredevil braved Niagara Falls. 1829, Scott. Jesus. That's a long time ago. Do we have video of it? No, there is no video. There's like little crappy cartoons. Remember the ones that you would see in old newspapers of yeah. like the shittily drawn yeah, <laughs> cartoons? Yeah. Uh, well, this is that case. Uh, so this guy was a 22-year-old man named Sam Patch. Hmm. And he was from Pawtucket, Rhode Island. Pawtucket. What a great name, Pawtucket. Pawtucket. Patch went by a number of nicknames, including the Jersey Jumper, the Daring Yankee, and the Yankee Leaper. <laughs> this is not the best nicknames, I'm sorry. He was more of a high diver, uh, like a jumper, yeah. other than uh, to somebody to go over falls. So this is what early daredevils did. They would just jump in. Yeah. They wouldn't actually go over the falls because they all thought they would die. Well, I mean, it's, you know, there's no plank leading off of the Niagara Falls. So. Well, he did build a plank <laughs> out <laughs> over he did. the falls. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. So he would jump into the whirlpool, essentially, below the falls. For real? Yep, from 125 feet up. That's what he did? That is what he did. He, holy crap. How did that turn out? Well, we got to talk a little bit about how he got started first. Yeah, yeah, please. So after taking dares from co-workers to leap into the falls near the Pawtucket Cotton Factory where he worked, Patch developed a taste for higher and higher leaps at increasingly perilous locations. 
He realized the higher he went, the more dangerous the stunt, the more people would crowd around the bridges and shores to watch him plummet into the water far below. Yeah. And he was usually wearing nothing more than a cotton shirt and underwear. Well, you gotta stay breezy. But he was an enterprising young man. Patch wanted to turn people's curiosity into dollar bills for himself, so he began charging people to watch him risk his life. He has been called America's first professional waterfall jumper. What an oddly specific profession. <laughs> there was a second? What? Yeah, I don't know. Like, Wow, okay. Uh, yeah. I, yeah. <laughs> Patch always had his eyes on that big prize, the falls at Niagara. He thought if he could successfully survive a well-advertised stunt there, he'd earn himself a lot of cash and cement his place in American history. Sure. A have you heard of this guy? Uh, no, I love his name, but no. Sam Patch. Yeah. Well, it's... neither had I. I mean, you know, he wants to cement his place in history, but neither of us have heard of him. Yeah, well, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> From an article on Sam Patch on the Atlas Obscura site, quote, on October 7th, 1829, he leapt from a platform on Goat Island, which divides the two sets of falls on American side from the Horseshoe Falls on the Canadian side. New York's Evening Post reported that he, quote, walked out, clad in white, with great deliberation, put his hands close to his side, and jumped from the platform into the midst of the vast gulf of foaming waters from which none of humankind had ever before emerged in life, end quote. God, I can't imagine that moment when you're like, well, I'm here. Might as well yep. do it. Like, it's, Yep. Oh. My underwear, there would be a brown stain in the back. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Good thing you're going into the water. You get to wash it all away. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> so he lived. Wait a minute. And 10 days later, he leapt from a higher platform. Okay. And he survived that, too. <laughs> and he earned a bit of cash for each each of his leaps. So. Holy shit. Yeah, he lived. He Like I say, he wasn't going over the falls, yeah. but he was going into the water below. Uh, on November 13th, 1929, Patch was set to perform what was touted as ominously Sam's last jump. <laughs> no, that's a bad naming. Uh. Yeah. This was his second jump from the High Falls at the Genesee River in Rochester, New York. Patch scaled the 125-foot tower at 2 p.m., made a weird rambling speech, and was off the platform. From Atlas Obscura, when Patch leapt, something wasn't right. After descending the first third of the way, quote, as handsomely as he ever did, said the Evening Post, Patch, quote, evidently began to droop, his arms were extended, and his legs separated. And in this condition, he struck the water and sunk forever. Whew. Wow. Oh, I, you know, I would, like, the first jump, you're like, dude, you're playing with fire here. You would think you do, you successfully, you're like, whew, okay, I'm good. I'm good, yeah. let's not. Well, so he jumps twice at Niagara, lives, and then he goes does a smaller falls and dies. That's, that's the one that gets him. Right? <sighs> um, some thought he might have been drunk that day uh, because he'd had a few belts to brace himself <laughs> against the frigid water, you know? Yeah, I mean, sure. You know, I've I've overshot the mark myself before, you know? Yeah. You, you think that you've, you've only had a couple and you've had way too many. You know, and I don't even drink, but I think that that probably would be something that... Uh... <laughs> I may do before jumping off of a falls. So it was his last jump. His corpse was found 11 kilometers down the river four months later. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. Poor poor Sam Patch. Yeah. I mean, you've got to recognize that this is a likely outcome of the profession you have chosen. Right. But that doesn't mean that it's still not sad that a person died. But uh, yeah, that's the, it's one of the, we've talked about it in the past, um, I don't want to do anything where your first mistake equals death. Right. You know, like the, 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 uh, plus minus is one. Yeah. On whether you live or not. That's too, too, too low a ratio for me. Exactly. It's, it's not good. No. People have sent many things careening over the falls. We'd be remiss if we didn't mention some idiots that have felt it necessary to send live animals. Oh. Uh, some, including a cat, 
were used to test the safety of contraptions later utilized by the human daredevils. No. From Wikipedia, quote, In 1827, William Forsyth, and hotel owner, bought a schooner called Michigan. He filled it with a buffalo, two small bears, two raccoons, and a dog. Some reports say two foxes, 15 geese, and an eagle were also included. After the schooner was sent adrift, the two bears jumped free and swam to Goat Island. Oh, good. The rest of the animals, with the exception of the geese, perished going over the falls, end quote. What the hell? I don't know. Like, I guess maybe entertainment was a little different in 1827. Let's let's watch animals die. Like, that sounds like a really fun thing. I want to punch Mr. Forsyth in the nose. That was quite the idiot's arc. Jesus. Not good. No. Again, from Wikipedia and NiagaraFrontier.com, in mid-July 1853, a man named Joseph Avery, who's been called Samuel Avery in other accounts, you know how names get mixed up over the years. Yeah. He went over American Falls, having spent 18 hours clinging to a log in the rapids above the waterfall. He and two other men had been working on a barge and drinking and attempted to row from Goat Island to the mainland when their boat capsized. The two other occupants of the boat went over the falls immediately and died. Uh, Avery grabbed onto the tree roots growing from a rock just east of Chapin Chapin Island and weathered the current for 18 hours. Holy Christ. And that's, that's not going to be warm water. Several attempts were made at rescue the next morning, and a boat tethered to the Bath Island Bridge was guided downstream to reach Avery. He was able to climb onto that boat, but it immediately capsized, throwing him back into the water. Avery was swept over the American Falls to his death. And interestingly... <sighs> So we're talking 1853. Yeah. A daguerreotype of Avery holding onto the log was made by a photographer named Platt D. Babbitt. Shit. We'll show you folks the picture, but uh, you can see the little dude there in the middle. Gives me the heaves. Whew. Yeah, it's, it's fascinating that... You know, that long ago, someone was able to capture a photo. Well, you know, and it's not like you just pull out your phone nowadays. Like a camera back then is a large contraption that takes a while to set up. Right. But I guess he had the time because the guy had been there for 18 hours. So we'll take a break right here. <laughs> and we'll, we'll come back and we'll talk about some more of the, uh, the daredevils. And we'll get into Scott's barrels. <laughs> that's what you want to hear about. It really is. It really people. is. And we're back. Uh, what do you think so far, Scott? Um, oh, I hate to say it, but entertaining. It's fascinating to think, like, how many people have ended their lives there. Well, and I'm thinking about also, like, I I'm quite confident you can't scuba dive at the bottom of the falls. But, I want, like, I wonder if you were to send a submergible down. Boats have gone over. People, who, I'm sure all kinds of shit have been thrown over there. It's, it's probably like a massive metal graveyard. Oh, something. Yeah. Just all kinds of contraptions, I'm sure. On October 24th, 1901, was when the first adventurer went over Niagara Falls in a barrel. <laughs> now, what kind of person do you have in your mind's eye as that daredevil, Scott? Uh, the town rummy. The town rummy? Yeah. So you think the town rummy was the daredevil? I, I would, like, to me, I'm thinking, like, it's not going to be a lawyer who's like, you know what, this will this will be a good laugh. Like, I'm thinking it, it's somebody who just is uh, um, a little cuckoo. Yep. And maybe a little sauced. Okay. And um, thinks that this is going to work out great. Okay. So you don't think it was planned out? It was just like, I'm going to hop in a barrel and go. I mean, maybe planned out for like an hour. Okay. No, those were good guesses. But the first person who went over the barrel, her uh, went over in a barrel. Her name was Annie Edson Taylor. She was a 63-year-old. <laughs> Broke, depressed, former dance instructor. She'd been widowed during the Civil War. I mean, I got some of that, right? You know, a little cuckoo. In his book, Niagara, Canadian author and media personality Pierre Burton unkindly described Annie as a, quote, bulky 
and shapeless woman of 63. Jesus. With coarse features and a rasping voice. <laughs> well, that's a terrible description of somebody. Wow. So she's the first one to do this in a barrel. What was going through her mind? What was the thought process of like, you know what will be the best mode of transportation? A barrel. So she was sitting in her Bay City, Michigan rooming house. Okay. Bay City is quite a ways away from Niagara Falls. So I don't know why she would think Niagara Falls specifically. Mm -hmm. You know, she couldn't twirl on the dance floor like she used to. People weren't paying her. Yeah, exactly. She wasn't getting paid to, uh, to teach dance anymore. So she... Wanted a way to make money. As we all do. She had heard that others had gone over smaller, rocky rapids in reinforced barrels, but no one had yet braved Niagara. Oh, so there was a pre-existing history of barrels and falls. Right, but not at Niagara Falls. So she wanted to be the first person to go over Niagara Falls in a barrel. Okay. Well, as word got out about the upcoming stunt, Annie publicly denied that she was suicidal, saying she was a good Christian. Mm -hmm. But privately, she wrote in her diary that she had other more realistic thoughts about what she was about to attempt. Mm. From Burton's Niagara, quote, I might as well be dead as to remain in my present condition, she declared. Death was certainly in her mind. Mm -hmm. It would be fame and fortune or instant death, she wrote. In one way or another, the barrel symbolized escape. Yeah, so there, you know, the barrel moment is going to be a transitional moment for her. Uh, no more middle ground. No more just getting by life depressed. It's either fame and riches or death. Those were both the, the better options other than how life was for her at that moment in her head. I'm picking up what you're putting down. Yeah, yeah, barrels. On her 63rd birthday, Annie climbed into the five-foot-long, 160-pound barrel made by a local cooper from Pierre Burton's Niagara. Quote, she squeezed through the opening of the barrel and buckled herself into the special harness designed to hold her fast to the bottom. Protected from buffeting by two cushions and a pillow, she gripped a strap on either side as a further stabilizing precaution. Three air holes stopped with removable corks had been drilled into the barrel. After the two-inch thick cover was fitted into place, Billy Holleran worked away for 20 minutes with a bicycle pump at the air holes to replenish some of Annie's air. I'll give her enough gas to last her for a week, he cried enthusiastically. <laughs> oh, God. The barrel was towed out above the falls by assistants and rowboats. According to Burton's book, Annie complained that the barrel was leaking slightly, <laughs> but her assistant told her she'd be fine. He said the water would keep her awake. Sure. I mean, like, I know. <laughs> did he realistically think that somebody may fall asleep while going over the Niagara Falls? I don't know. No one had ever done it before, so. You know, there's the possibility of it being so calming and soothing that you'll just go right out. When the boat and the barrel were in the right position, the barrel was released and off Annie's barrel went, picking up speed as it headed toward the massive drop off Horseshoe Falls. The large crowd lining the shore gasped with anticipation as it got closer to its goal. The barrel went over the precipice of the angry rapids of Niagara Falls, plunging into the abyss below and disappeared beneath the torrent. Oh, my God. So what do you think happened? Yeah, you know, I'm going to say uh, success was not had. After being submerged for what some said was an entire minute, the barrel dramatically reappeared. Pierre Burton wrote that it, quote, shot out of the water 10 or 15 feet into the air. <laughs> oh, my God. Dropped and plunged again and was hurled back into the cavern behind the sheet of water. There, it was picked up by the force of the waters, dashed around in the midair, and dropped onto the rocks. Holy shit. Yeah, that's not good. So even if the fall you survive, it sounds like the battering one would take afterwards would finish you off. Right. Whew. The crew at the bottom of the falls reached the barrel and removed the top. Annie Edson Taylor's head popped out of the barrel, looking stunned from the force of the beating she'd taken inside. 
She was bruised, bleeding profusely from a scalp wound, and required help walking as she was extremely dizzy and surely concussed. Holy fuck, she survived? <laughs> yep. Holy shit, Annie! <laughs> Although mildly worse for wear, she was relatively okay. Especially considering many, including Annie herself at various points during the exercise, believed she was done for. My god, and if... if memory serves me correct you said part of the cushioning she had was a pillow yep, yep. <laughs> it was it was it was a couple of pillows <laughs> what yeah. the hell wow annie she walked away she walked away from it <laughs> well she was helped away yes wobbled away exactly from burton's niagara quote have i gone over the falls she asked wearily and then i'm cold yeah <laughs> i've lost my power of speech I want to go home. Holy shit. Wow. I think I got the vapors. She would later describe the terrifying drop over the edge like this. I felt as though all nature was being annihilated. <laughs> oh, I cannot. Yeah, that's a pretty good description, I think. <laughs> She said being bashed about in the whirlpools below the falls seemed like she was inside a butter churn. Well, she essentially was. I mean, a long cylindrical uh, butter butter churn. Yeah. yeah. Oh. Some people actually cried hoax, but Annie had really done it. She toured her story for the next few years until she became too elderly, never making the kind of money or getting the kind of fame that she'd actually envisioned. Oh, she should have been bathed in gold after that. Yeah, well, she wasn't. That's boo world. Composer Michael John Lachuiza wrote a musical <laughs> called Queen of the Mist based on Annie Taylor's life. Oh. So, well, someone wrote a musical about her. Sure. <laughs> I mean, that that's probably was pretty common back then. Well, let's make a musical about this. Whereas now, it's let's make a movie. Let's make a song and dance about this plight. Annie was 82 when she died at the Niagara County Infirmary in Lockport, New York. She was buried next to another daredevil in the Stunter's Rest section of Oakwood Cemetery in Niagara Falls, New York. <laughs> the Stunter's section of the cemetery. Wow. An inscription on her gravestone reads, Annie Edson Taylor, first to go over Horseshoe Fall and live. <laughs> I think the tombstone should have just read, holy shit, she did it. <laughs> You right? <laughs> oh my God! I guess you could say uh, she was ahead of her time, girl power wise. Like really, if you think about it. No kidding, and in her sixties. Yeah. A fucking barrel. Uh, we'll put up the picture of Annie in her barrel. Um, she's wearing her long dress and has. I wonder if she wore that hat and and that <laughs> flower when she was in the barrel. Well, I mean, it might qualify as a helmet. It could. When you look at the photo and you look at her face, you're not thinking like this is a person who's confident in what she's about to do. No, no. But yet survived. Annie's my hero now. I felt as though all nature was being annihilated. <laughs> I want to get a tattoo of Annie and her barrel across my back now. Oh, gosh. Right? Many would follow Annie, but not all would fare so well. There were accidents, too. For example, some people walked out onto the partially frozen Niagara Falls and fell over <laughs> oh, shit. in one particular winter. In 1903, a New York Times obituary read in part, quote, Niagara Falls, New York, July 9th. The body of Edward Delahante, the right fielder in the Washington baseball team of the American League who fell from the International Bridge last Thursday night, was taken from the river at Lower Niagara Gorge today. Relatives of Delahante arrived here this afternoon and positively identified the body of that of the missing baseball player. Delahante's body was mangled, one leg was torn off, presumably by the propeller of the Maid of the Mist. Whoa near whose landing the body was found. The body will be shipped to Washington later tonight. Um, so Ed had accidentally fallen off the bridge. Um, mm -hmm. Ed had accidentally fallen into the river off this bridge and was swept over. And the reason he was on the bridge was he had been kicked off the train on the Canadian side. Oh. 
for being drunk and disorderly. Yeah, oh, so sauced. Yeah, and so what he did, rather than, you know, as the train, after the train left him and went over the bridge, he decided, oh, I'll just walk over by myself. I didn't know there was a walking bridge. There isn't. He walked over the train bridge. Oh, oh, oh. oh. Yeah, that, it didn't turn out so good for Ed. Oh, God. Yeah, they're not the best, uh, easiest thing to traverse uh, when sober. No. And, uh, oh, my God. Well, Ed. The next to make his way over the falls in a barrel was an English stuntman named Bobby Leach. According to an archived page from the nflibrary.ca, quote, on July 25th, 1911, he made the trip successfully, but not undamaged. He received two broken kneecaps and a broken jaw. He became the first successful, his became the first successful navigation of the falls. No, but Annie yeah. had already done that. Yeah, weird. Hmm, interesting. I guess they, you know, discounted the woman's component. Right? Of it. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting that the paper would say that. Old Bobby Leach spent six months in the hospital, but went on to do more stunts. He was finally done in by an orange peel <laughs> that he slipped on during a speaking tour in New Zealand in 1925. Oh my God, that's how you go out? Well, due to injuries sustained by the evil peel, Leach's leg became gangrenous and required amputation. He died due to complications from that procedure. Could you imagine? Like, I have gone over the falls in a barrel. Successfully. Successfully gone over Niagara Falls in a barrel. Mm -hmm. Oops. Orange peel. That does it right there. Like, my God. Wow. If, if there is a heaven and you do talk to your buddies and stuff up there, I, you know, you, you don't admit to that. You don't admit. Oh, yeah, I, I, was, I, I was rescuing a cat from a fire. Like, you know, at no point, no point in time do the words orange peel ever come up. The next daredevil to attempt the falls in a barrel was awarded a Darwin Award in 1994 for his fatal stupidity. On July 11, 1920, a barber... An English daredevil named Charles Stevens took a run at the falls in his own barrel. He'd been warned to test this barrel first, but <laughs> refused to heed the good advice. That's advice you take. From Wikipedia, quote, Stevens had not only strapped himself into the barrel, but also strapped his feet to the anvil, which he was using as ballast. As a result, Stevens was dragged under the falls after the anvil broke the bottom of the barrel. Stevens' severed right arm, the only part recovered, is buried in the Drummond Hills Cemetery at Niagara Falls, Ontario. Holy crap. The tattoo in his arm read, Don't forget me, Annie. Did it? Seriously? It did. And maybe Annie was his wife, but it's sort of another irony. That's quite bizarre. Wow, okay. Wow. So there you go. You're the guys picking the barrel out of the water and you notice, oop, the bottom's gone. Uh-oh, where's Mr. Stevens? And then you look inside and there's his, only his arm left strapped in there. Yeah, I mean, like, I don't know a lot uh, in life. But one thing I do know, if you're doing anything water related at no point in time, should you strap your feet to an anvil? That That I know. That I know. You have a good grasp of physics there, Scott. I do. Yeah, I know. Yeah. That comes naturally to me. Apparently. Yeah. The next person to survive a trip over the falls was a man named Smiling Jean Lucier. Hmm. Instead of a barrel, Lucier built a different kind of contraption to carry him. According to the book, Uncle John's Bathroom Reader Plunges into Canada, A, eh? <laughs> he constructed, quote, a 1.8 meter, six foot rubber ball reinforced with steel bands. Inside, he also reinforced the bottom edge with 68 kilograms, 150 pounds, of solid rubber, of solid rubber padding and ballast. Then he lined the inside floor, walls and ceiling with more than 30 inflated inner tubes, leaving a little space in the center for himself. I mean, that sounds like not a bad idea. It sounds like cheating. I don't think there's ever cheating when you, as long as you go over the falls... That you didn't cheat in my books. Fair enough. He went over and he lived and he came out of the ball grinning, going on to sell photos of his extraction and pieces of rubber he claimed were, quote, genuine pieces of the ball. Although some said that he was cutting up inner tubes long after the rubber from the original construction had been depleted. Yeah, because at some point it's going to run out. Yeah. 
but you know, you still want, he was making like 50 cents per piece, which at the time would have been like seven bucks. Yeah. So yeah, he was making some good coin. Yeah. Well, you go over the falls, you deserve to get paid. There you go. <laughs> A chef named George Stathakis went over the falls in his own barrel in 1930 with his 150 year old pet turtle, Sonny, to keep him company. <laughs> Oh, poor Sonny. George survived the initial fall, but smothered to death when his air ran out as the barrel could not be recovered for 18 hours after the stunt. Oh my God, what a way to go. Sonny the turtle survived. Thank God. Sonny didn't choose to go over the falls. No. Sonny was kidnapped beyond his uh, wishes and taken over the falls. So I'm glad Sonny survived. George's original barrel was apparently on display at Niagara Falls at some point. Okay. And I've seen a photo of the barrel tipped on its side and inside, poking her head out, is a grinning ponytailed little girl playing around in the contraption that killed its creator. How weird is that? I mean, that's a pretty professional looking barrel he created, but yeah, yeah, I know. Uh, air needs to be able to get in at some point. Look, that, does she have a smile on that girl's face? Somebody died in here. <laughs> like, what the hell? <laughs> what better place to play? <laughs> this is fun. A man died here. <laughs> oh, shoot. Going over Horseshoe Falls became illegal. The Canadian authorities especially said, no more. We don't need people doing this because it's just attracting the wrong kind of people. <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah, I would imagine. They made it a finable offense. Don't want people to do this. But that didn't stop a guy named Nathan Boya. On July 15th, 1961, according to Wikipedia, he, quote, went over the falls in a rubber ball nicknamed the Plungosphere. <laughs> <laughs> the ball hit rocks on impact. And bounced, but Boya was uninjured. Oh. So again, we, here we have it. So the rubber ball seems to be a better way of going about going over the falls. Well, it's kind of what led me originally to ask, like, who decided a barrel seems like the most, uh, this will be the best method of going over waterfalls. Because definitely a rubber ball, a larger rubber ball seems uh, seems much more logical. No Canadians actually attempted the falls until 1984. Perhaps we're smarter than everyone else or just more fearful. We just got dumber later. One of us had to do it though. And this guy used a metal and fiberglass barrel from Uncle John's bathroom reader plunges into Canada a, quote, the first Canadian to make the plunge, Carol Susek, was a professional stuntman from Hamilton, Ontario. He ended up trapped in rough waters for 45 minutes afterwards. So he was probably grateful that he'd equipped his barrel with two tiny windows and a snorkel for breathing. He was eventually fished out, his cuts and bruises and chipped tooth were put right, and he was fined $500. So, so far, there's a fairly substantial survival rate of going over. You know, as long as you were in like a, an object or something of some kind. Six months later, Susek was hired to appear at the Houston Astrodome and recreate his Niagara Fall. Dropped in a wooden barrel from the same height into a 10-foot pool of water should have been safer than going over Horseshoe Falls, especially, you know. Uh -huh. Except that the barrel missed the center of the pool Oh. Slammed hard against the edge, and Susek was severely injured and died shortly thereafter. Oh, my God. Right? Wow. I'm noticing a trend. Mm -hmm. Sure, you made it, but the falls will get you. If you've done it, they're going to get you. Yeah. Um, it, it seems like there's a lot of, if you survive that, then you get to a point where you're like, I can do anything now. There were numerous other attempts to go over the falls in the intervening years, and some were foiled by police, some made it, but the stories got less press than earlier attempts in hopes to prevent copycats. Yeah. But they continued to come. And here are some of the successes as a noted on NiagaraFallsLive.com. August 18th, 1985, a Rhode Island bartender named Stephen Trotter made the trip in a barrel wrapped in inner tubes. Stephen was fined a total of $5,503. <laughs> On October 5th, 1985, a Canadian mechanic, John Super Dave Monday, 
made a successful trip in his barrel. Dave could not get enough. He made a second successful trip on September 26, 1993. On September 28, 1989, Niagara Falls, Ontario residents Peter DiBernardi and Jeffrey James Petkovich accomplished the first duo descent of the falls. So two dudes in a barrel. Holy shit. I hope they really liked each other because I wouldn't, <laughs> I don't know, like, I mean, I, I love you, Scott, but I, I can't see us going over Niagara Falls together in a barrel. No, no, no yeah. Yeah, you know, it was difficult enough just being on a plane with you, let alone <laughs> let, let alone a barrel. I, you know I'm fat. I take up a lot of the seats. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> on June 18th, 1995, Steve Trotter returned to the falls to make his second attempt, this time with a partner, Lori Martin, a caterer from Georgia. They were the first male and female to make the big drop together. So there's been quite a few successful. Wow. Wow. On June 5th, 1990, a man ironically named Jesse Sharp went over the falls in a whitewater canoe. No, that's, um, no. According to InfoNiagara.com, Sharp did not wear a protective helmet so his face would be visible on film. He also didn't wish to wear a life jacket, believing it would interfere with his ability to escape in the event that he was caught underneath the falls. Oh my God. His body was never recovered. Yeah, yeah, not so sharp. Ew. On October 1st, 1995, a 39-year-old daredevil named Robert Overacker rode his jet ski over the brink of Horseshoe Falls to help promote awareness for the homeless. His intent was to leap off his machine and parachute to safety. Overacker died in the attempt. According to NiagaraFallsLive.com, quote, his parachute did not open and Robert ended up promoting better parachutes. End quote. A tourist from Egypt captured a photo of Overacker midair just as he'd gone over the falls with his machine falling away below him. Holy shit. On October 22nd, 2003, a man named Kirk Jones from Canton, Michigan became the first known human being to have survived a trip over the falls wearing only the clothes on his back. Holy shit. Jones and his pal had been getting pissed the night before when Jones told them he was going to do it. He wanted them to video record it, but his buddies didn't know how to work the machine. <laughs> Jones went for it anyway. He just climbed up on the railing and hopped over. Holy shit. According to Michael Clarkson's aforementioned book, The River of Lost Souls, Jones said, quote, I was depressed with turning 40, and I thought, life wasn't worth going on. But after hitting the falls and surviving, I feel it's worth living. In one interview, he said, I thought it would be the most peaceful way to go out. I'm not scared of water. I don't own weapons. I can't kill myself in that way. And I don't want to drive a car into a house or set myself on fire. End quote. But, uh, you know, I don't know how cool it is having your friends watch you. <laughs> hey guys, watch as I kill myself. Right. Attempt to anyways, but yeah. Jones was fined $2,300 and banned from entering Canada for life. <laughs> well, this will not be the last time we hear of Mr. Jones, just so you know. Oh, goodness. Okay. In 2009, another unnamed man went over the falls, surviving an attempt to die by suicide. The torrent tore off his clothes and he was cut and bruised badly, but otherwise all right. Oh, Wow. On a busy evening in the summer of 2011, a Japanese exchange student named Ayano Tokamasu climbed over the protective railing to get a better look at the falls. She lost her footing and died going over. Oh, shit. In 2012, another man survived an attempt to die by suicide. And he, w and although badly injured, he made it. But what a memory to have. Right. There's, a, you know, not a lot of people who can share that experience. And so that would be quite something. Well, so Kirk Jones, we're back to this guy again. He was the guy who survived unprotected in 2003. He came back for a second attempt on April 19th, 2017. No. But this time he had an inflatable ball. You know, the kind that they used in Jackass when they went down the... Yeah. It's just your standard kind of like a human uh, hamster ball. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's exactly what it was. Yeah. This time he also had a large snake with him. What? Jones' ball was found spinning in the foam at the bottom of the falls, minus Jones and his snake. 
His body was found two months later down the river. So the falls finally got him too. Yeah, I mean, you're you're playing with waterfalls. I mean, that, you know, you, 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 the odds are that you're not going to survive something like that once. So don't don't test uh, those odds by doing it again. But he was probably in that same state where he suicidal and didn't care. And I like that uh, most of the people who are, um, who have suicidal intentions are not named anymore. Yeah. Yeah, we see that a lot just in um, uh, how the media uh, in North America anyways covers um, uh, suicide attempts and stuff. You know, they don't publicize there's a jumper on the bridge or they just say there's a police incident and uh, they don't want to glorify it in any way. In 2019, this is the last one that uh, has been recorded. Uh, another unnamed man survived plummeting over Horseshoe Falls during an unsuccessful attempt at completing suicide. Hmm. He was found injured and despondent by rescuers sitting on rocks below the falls. So he'd even been able to pull himself out. Wow. And... If you look at uh, the Niagara Falls live camera right now, any time actually um, over the past month and a bit, there's nobody there. This place that is usually packed full of people mm. due to this weirdness that's happening in the world right now, there is no one there. Certainly an odd thing happening because of it is all these uh, very, very uh, public tourist attractions. Mm-hmm are just these uh, uh, empty spaces now. It's it's an odd sensation. So I'm terrified of heights and I don't want to die. So yeah. I can think of other things that I'd rather do with my time. <laughs> but what do you think? Would you give the falls a go if you had like a protected vehicle of some kind or? Oh my God. Uh, no. I, you know, I stupidly would give it some consideration if I was in something where you're almost assured you'd survive. But then I'm just like, I'm trying to, in my head, think about it like if it was bungee jumping. If they could right. assure that you're, you know, you're not going to be seriously hurt or anything. Um, or killed. You know, may, maybe, but then I'm just thinking about like, well, I, I, I'm not interested in taking that risk. No. But I, I think the same thing with bungee jumping, you know, like part of me is like, yeah, you know, I think I, I would I would like that. But I know the second I'm standing up on that edge. Oh, yeah. No, I'd back out. I would I would chicken out. I'd be the guy in the plane, you know, that the, the parachuting instructor would have to push out. <laughs> I, w I would be that guy. Or your tandem. And it's like, you don't have a say, you're attached to somebody's back. Oh, my gosh. That's the only way I could probably do any of these things. I've told you the story about my friend Ron and doing his tandem parachute jump. Oh, I think so. Ron goes out with his tandem on somebody's chest. So they strap you to the, to the chest. The guy is on your back essentially. Yep. And so, because he's got the parachute yep. and there's another person with a camera videotaping and the guy kept telling Ron to smile, like making gestures at him to smile. Come on, smile, smile, smile for the camera. And so Ron smiled for the camera and he had dentures and they just <laughs> whipped right out of his mouth. Oh shit. And so for the rest of the time he said, here, here I am watching my video later on and all I can see is my lips flapping because I don't have any <laughs> teeth. <laughs> oh shit. Oh man. Oh. Anyway, that's it for this week's, uh. <laughs> Woo. That was a entertaining one. Yeah, a little different. I, I wanted to make it a little different because, yeah. uh, you know, we definitely uh, need a little break from all the murder and stuff like that going on. Uh, and it's certainly an odd, uh, dark part of uh, Canadian history, that's for sure. Uh, let's, uh, ooh, I wonder if we should, we should see if we have some voicemails, Scott. Oh, let's. Yeah, let's let's check and see if anybody has called us at one eight seven seven three two seven five seven eight six or one eight seven seven D A R K P T N. That's one eight seven seven Dark. Well, here's one from Texas. Let's listen to a voicemail oh. from Texas. We better get a y'all in there. I don't know. 
We'll see. Hey, Mike and Scott. This is Abby from Texas. I just wanted to say that I really enjoy the show, and um, I really appreciate the the banter that you guys have in between each other and um, the way that you present the cases with respect and still provide some of that uh, humor every once in a while. Um, uh, yeah, that's that's all I wanted to say. And uh, go take a poop in your toque. Bye, guys. Well, thank you, Abby from Texas. We didn't get a yell, but I could hear a little bit of that Texas accent. Yeah, and it was there. a very pleasant message. So thank you, Abby. Exactly. We appreciate that. Very. Oh, here's one from Ohio. Hey, Mike and Scott. This is Morgan from Cincinnati, Ohio. I uh, just wanted to call and say thank you for everything you guys do. Um, I work in psychiatry and mental health, and I really appreciate any time podcasters talk about mental health issues, but especially when men talk about it, because sometimes that's a really neglected group. Um, and also, I love all the true crime coverage and all the special Canadian spins. I'm an American, but I used to vacation in uh, St. Andrews, New Brunswick every year. and I miss it a lot, especially right now. Uh, so anyway, thanks so much again. And uh, I'm not going to tell you to shit in your hat, but uh, how about you go take a duke in your toque? Thanks. Bye. <laughs> That's our second poop in our toque today. Yeah, yeah. yeah but I think I'm we'll good take with it. it. And thank you so much. I really love uh, getting messages like that. And uh, Cincinnati, say say hi to Les Nestman for me. Oh, yeah. The turkey drop. Yeah. That was a great show. I, I always uh, sort of associated myself with Dr. Johnny Fever. Oh, did you? Yeah. Yeah, and I ended up having the same sort of issues that <laughs> he did anyway. So, uh, <laughs> That's true. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no herb tarlic for you. Uh, well, I'm probably actually more of a herb tarlic, kind of. <laughs> I don't know. I think you're less Nessman. Oh, a hundred percent. Yeah, yeah. You've got to be less Nessman. Yeah. Here's one from New York City. Oh, jeez. Hey guys, my name is Taya. I am in New York City, and I just wanted to leave an appreciation voicemail because, um, as you know. The situation in New York is really dark right now. Um, it kills me as a New Yorker not to be able to go outside and uh, speed walk and, you know, do a million things at once. But um, I understand the importance of staying inside um, and helping to flatten the curve. So all that being said, I wanted to send you a thank you voicemail. Um, I think what you guys do is great. And it gives me, um, as a true crime, you know, fanatic uh, aficionado, student, whatever you want to call it, um, it gives me insight into um, some Canadian crimes that I had never heard about. So thank you so much. Uh, keep doing what you're doing. You guys are great. Bye-bye. Oh, thank you so much for staying safe. Right. Uh, scary times. Scary times everywhere right now, but uh, New York is just... It's oh, terrifying. Yeah. 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 So thanks for the message and, and glad thanks, you're safe. Thanks, Taya. Yeah, and, and keep washing your hands and staying inside. I know it's tough. Like, yeah, New York is a city of people moving about, you know? So it's oh, yeah. got to be tough for them right now. I mean, especially, um, it's a very real thing what's happening. Uh, it's a city of energy. There's yeah. always stuff happening. And so, uh, it, yeah, it's a very difficult place to try to be sedate. All right, that's it for this week's voicemails. Thank you, folks, for taking the time to... Uh, Send us one. And if yeah. yours really stands out, you might hear it on the show. Call us at one 327 5786 one dark putin I guess it's time for shout-outs to our Patreon patrons. Let's do it. I'm still amazed people are still signing up for Patreon. Um, I know. I know. You would think in the climate we're in that just wouldn't be happening, but uh, amazed that it is. People are very kind. Absolutely. I'm, I'm, I'm blown away actually by how uh, the reactions of a lot of people right now are, uh, I'm really impressed with yeah. some, some folks. Yeah, I agree. You know, and it's actually a majority of, of folks seem to be 
really stepping up in this with all this nonsense going on. Mm -hmm. People seem to really want to have each other's back. Well, kind of have to. You know, so it's when you're you when you're forced into these corners that you really see uh, who people are, and you're really getting a glimpse that there's just a lot of incredible, amazing people out there. Vicky Ansley. I don't know where Vicky's from. Oh, you don't? No. Now you said Vicky Ansley, right? Vicky Ansley, yes. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. We're we're quite good friends. Yeah. Oh, uh, Vicky, okay. Vicky lives in Fada, which is in Chad. Oh, Fada. Yeah, Fada in in, in Chad. Is that next to Mudda? Uh, they're sick of that joke, Mike. No, they don't they're like Mudda Fada. No, no, they're no. so sick of that joke. They're so sick of it. But it's uh, yeah, yeah. She uh is a um turnip farmer. Oh, a turnip farmer. Yeah, yeah. I like turnips. Yeah. Only turnips. Won't so farm she gets, anything else. She, She's getting to the root of the problem. <laughs> oh, my. She actually has that on her farm shirts. <laughs> yep, in Fada. It, it, next to Mudda. Yep, yep. Oh. Well, thank you, Vicki Ansley. We're glad that turnip farmers are still able to do their thing. Absolutely, totally. totally. Next up is, is Sharon Dale. I don't know where Sharon's from either. Uh, Natu in Peru. Oh, Natu in Peru. Yeah. Yeah. What does she do in Natu, Peru? Oh, it's a pretty common trade there. It's really quite... Uh, I like how you're prepared, by the way, this week. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, um, my brain is always prepared, Mike. Okay, sure. Uh, yeah, she, uh, uh, what she does is um, it's a very, very common and popular trade in Peru. Uh, she hand whittles pan flutes. Oh. Yeah. Those Peruvian flutes? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know Yeah, ones. yeah, yeah. Oh, you see the dudes beautiful... playing. Yeah, hmm. she makes, she puts a lot into each instrument. She only what makes does she one make of... them from? Uh, wood. Oh, okay. So nothing yeah. weird. Oh. No, no, but it, it uh, she only makes one a year and that's working full-time hours. It just takes that long. How does she make, is she making enough money to live? Are they like $50,000 each? Yeah, you've clearly never seen the price of a pan flute, Mike. No. Yeah, yeah, no, they're, they're. Nor they're, have I, I don't have the need to. Yeah, well, no, they're, they're, you know, you're looking, you need a mortgage to buy one. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> Next up, we have Mackenzie Gilbert, and she's from Coralville, Indiana. Oh, sweet. Coralville. That, Coralville. Sounds like a, that sounds like a nice place. It does, doesn't it? Yeah. So thank you, Mackenzie. Next we have from Orlando, Florida, a place we should be in two weeks but aren't yeah. going to be. Yeah. Hmm. Kristen Merrick. Yep. Thanks, Kristen. Thank you very much, Kristen. Very much. Next we have from Scotia, New York, oh. Colleen Harrigan Meisenholder. That's a name. Thank you. My holder. Wow. Well pronounced, Mike. Yeah, I didn't screw that up too badly, I don't not think. Not that we know anyways, yeah. <laughs> this one I'm pretty certain I'm not going to get wrong. Dave Gregory from Detroit, Michigan. Detroit. 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 The Motor City, as the kids like to say. Yeah, it's where Stevie Y played all those years. Mm-hmm. I loved me some Steve Yeiserman. He but was a hated, great player. Hated me some Red Wings. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Next up, we have Stephanie. I don't know where Stephanie's from. Oh, Stephanie. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't even need a last name. I don't even need a you last don't. name. Uh, you don't. I know. She, yeah, she's from Nook, Greenland. Oh, Greenland. Yeah, it's a coastal. It's a coastal town. Uh, Nook. I wasn't uh, even aware we actually got a download from Greenland. I've I've kind of looked around and I don't remember ever seeing Greenland. Oh, she uses a uh, uh like a VPN. VPN. Yeah. Ah. So yeah. Oh, yeah, so, so she's like in uh Swaziland or something. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. But no, she's from uh Nerd Nurk Nurk and New UK and New UK. Yeah. Okay. And yeah. what does she do there? She she makes fishing nets. 
Oh, that's probably a good thing in Greenland. Yeah, There's a lot yeah. of good fishing a, off there. Being a coastal city and all, that's it's really yep. it's uh, you know yeah she sells them internationally. Hmm. Yeah, it's it's not a good trade. <laughs> no, no, it's oh. not a good trade. She hates oh. every second of it. Oh, what would she rather be doing? Making pan flutes? Making <laughs> making butterfly nets. Oh, there you go. Yeah, those are her. So staying in the net choice. business. Yeah, staying yeah. in the. Yeah. She's good at what she does. Right. Yeah. Fishing nets are just so big though, Mike. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah. Next up, we have somebody who is giving us a very large amount per month. Oh, oh. We've opened up our PM, all that kind of stuff again. So up to $25. Lynette Busby, Lynette Busby oh. has given us $100 a month. What? Right. So Lynette, if you've made a mistake, <laughs> like you can, you can rectify that. Yeah. And if you haven't, thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Holy crappers. Wow. I don't know where Lynette's from, but it better be good. Yeah, she's from Mongolia. Oh, what did yeah, she do Al in- Alte specifically. Okay. And what yeah. does she do there? Uh, she makes, she, she's, uh, you ever been to Mongolian barbecue? You, you ever been? Yeah. Yeah. She invented the Mongolian barbecue style of cooking. Oh, wow. Yep. So if you've ever enjoyed some Mongolian barbecue uh, on a grill, um, you got to thank Lynette. Oh, okay. Yep. 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 Thank I, I thank you personally for, so love me a, a good uh, bar, Mo Mongolian barbecue. Well, I mean, a Mongolian barbecue is something that I quite enjoy. Yeah. Um, yeah so. And apparently 8% of, speaking of Mongolian barbecues, 8% of men in Asia have... Um, genetics connected to Genghis Khan. That's well, interesting. Well, that's, um, I came here for the podcast. I stayed for the education. Yeah. The only reason I know that is because I heard that, uh, on a, uh, a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> it's probably totally wrong. <laughs> well, podcasts don't lie. Our friend, Amanda Evans from Hamilton, Ontario is back. With oh. an upped pledge to, uh, yeah, so. Thank you, thank, Amanda. Thank you so much. Very, very much thank you. From Bracebridge, Ontario, we have Jessica Hennessy. Hennessy. Mm, fine beverage. I've never, I, I've never had Hennessy, and I probably won't because I don't drink, so. Neither have I, but all the rappers seem to love it, so. They like the Hennessy. Yeah, they love the Hennessy. From New Lowell, Ontario, we have Mike Bolesky. Oh. Mike Bolesky. Number 13, Mike Bolesky. It does sound like a hockey player. Oh, it really it? does, doesn't it? <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you, Mike Bolesky. On, starting on defense, Mike, <laughs> number five, Mike Bolesky. <laughs> we have Carrie Frankiewicz, and yep. she is from Regina, Saskatchewan. Oh, good old Regina. I've Regina. Been there. Rhymes with fun. <laughs> sure, Mike. Yeah. Yeah, fun. Next we have from Toronto, Ontario, Christina Davies. Thank you, Christina. Well, thank you, Christina. As the kids Lots would of like to Canadians say, the, the, doing the their thing. Dot. The T dot. Yeah. I love me some Toronto. I need to go back. I've got it, friends yeah. there and family and... Do and, it. uh, yeah, just something we need to do, I think, again. Do it. From Palmerston in Australia, Ooh. we have Karina McLeod Bourne. That's quite the dignified sounding name. Like the Bourne identity kind of thing. For a beard wetter. Beard wetter. Beard wetter in the water box. Water box. Yeah. Next we have upping her pledge is Shell Williams from Newark. Delaware. Well, thank you, Newark. De not Delaware. In New Jersey. Interesting. How many Newarks could there be? Exactly. At many, least two, I guess. apparently. <laughs> yep. And the last one we have is somebody, I don't know where this person lives, but his name is JJ Fat Tony. <laughs> wow. Hey, y hey, JJ Fat Tony, what are you wow. doing over there? Yeah. Uh, well, so the good news about JJ Fat Tony. Uh, he's from uh, La Sarina in Chile. 
Chile. Wait, Chile. I was I was kind of hoping he'd be us uh, like Italian. No, you would think so. Eh? You would think as the, hey, you it's know, JJ Fat Tony here. Yeah, from Chile. Huh? <laughs> from Chile. Okay. And what yeah. does he do in Chile? Does he make con carne? Uh no, Mike. Jesus. I know. It's just I insul- try. That's insulting. That's insulting. Uh, uh, well, no, what Fat Tony makes is, um, knives. Ooh. Yeah. He makes them himself. He forges them. Okay. From bigger knives. He makes them into smaller. Oh, He forges jeepers. them into smaller knives. Yeah. Yeah. But it's, you know, he's, he's, he's okay at it. I wouldn't, I'm not going to say he's great. He's still learning, but, uh, you know, you don't tell him I said that though. Oh, well, there you go. Yeah, donut money. Let's let's go on to donut money. Let's see. Did, any, did anybody give us some donut love? Yep, Lauren Smith Whoa. gave us some donut love. Thank you, Lauren. I don't Thank know where you, she's from. Uh, you don't? Nope. Oh, well, let me help help you. Let me help you. Uh, from Rosario in Argentina. Oh wow. Yeah. And what does what does Lauren do in our Argentina and Rosario in Argentina? It's a professional sun tanner. <laughs> what a good thing to do. Yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, it's that's a great. It, it's a it is a coveted job. Many people want it. Uh, it's not the best on your skin, you know. No. Um, well, but um you're already there. Why not get a tan you. on? Exactly. Yeah. So Alyssa Schuster sent us some donut money money with a note. Okay. And she said, I started listening from the beginning in December to keep me up while I made toques to stock my Etsy shop for the holidays. Whoa. And I just finally caught up. So, wow. wow. It took a while. Wow. Thanks for always keeping me giggling. My three-year-old loves when I take my headphones out so he can listen to the loons and the horns. You oh. guys are the best. Oh. Alyssa. Oh. That's really cool. Mm-hmm. Very so cool. So we can... We can entertain our younger listeners with horns and loons and then take the headphones away from them quickly. <laughs> and she makes, she's making toques. Right? How Isn't great. that cool? That's incredible. I think it's cool. So and, cool. and of course, uh, we got our monthly thing from Monet Terrio. <laughs> she's, she's like a running gag. Yeah. Thank you so much, Monet. You are awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So sorry we couldn't get Matt Damon on the show tonight. Yeah, right. Exactly. Yeah, is Jimmy? Or is Jimmy Kimmel still doing his show? I was watching Colbert the other day. I think so. I think so. Yeah, it's, it's really strange. All these people are doing their shows from home. I haven't watched any of them doing that. No, it's it's kind of sad in a way. Yeah, yeah. It's it, but it's also uh, fascinating to see how resourceful people are becoming. Yeah. Well, thanks so much to our patrons, past and present, for your pledges. Thank you so much for donating donut money. We really appreciate your support of the show, especially right now. Mm-hmm. If you want to help support support us, you can do so at patreon.com slash darkpoutine. Or for one-time support, you can send us donut money at, via PayPal at darkpoutinepodcast.gmail.com. If you don't already, it would mean a lot. If you subscribe to the show, you can easily find us on iTunes podcast, Stitcher, TuneIn, Spotify, or wherever you get your on-demand audio. Rate us on Podchaser. Lots of people have. Check out our website, darkpoutine.com, for show notes and other cool stuff. Give us a like or follow on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Just search for Dark Poutine. Most importantly, and thank you, most importantly, thank you for listening. Oh, yes. Many thank yous. Tell your friends about us. Word of mouth is a powerful thing. Wash your hands. Stay inside. Keep away from each other. If you don't need to be in people's faces right now, it's just not good. Pretty please. Pretty please. For not just for not just for us, for everybody. For, for everybody. the sake of humanity. Yeah. It's crazy. I don't know how long this is gonna go on, but uh Yeah. It's a weird world. It is. So uh, that's it for this week. Don't forget to be a good egg and not a bad apple. Bye-bye, everybody. Bad apples don't stay inside. Whoa, deep. Deep. <laughs>